Gold Ray Dam on the Rogue River was built in 1903-04 and for many years was the largest, most significant power generation facility in all of Southern Oregon. It brought new industry to the valley and it brought an excitement that's hard to imagine today. The video you're about to see is the story of the two brothers that thought up the idea, had the crazy notion that they could turn water into electricity in Southern Oregon, how they built the Gold Ray Dam, how they operated the Gold Ray Dam, and ultimately how the Gold Ray Dam outlived its usefulness. In 2010, to improve fish passage on the Rogue River, the Gold Ray Dam was taken out, the powerhouse was dismantled, parts of it were salvaged, and most of it was taken away. The Gold Ray Dam stood on the Rogue River for 106 years. It doesn't anymore. This is the story of the Gold Ray Dam. Colonel Frank Ray lived in New York. He was a vice president of the American Tobacco Company. His brother, Charles Ray, also known as Dr. Ray, had been in Alaska where he was trying his hand at gold mining, apparently with not much success. As Charles was getting ready to leave Alaska, Frank communicated to him, why don't you go to Medford and check on my investments there. Frank owned the Braden Mine, which was a very profitable mine near Gold Hill. Charles went down to Medford, investigated, uh, saw the possibilities, and apparently decided to stay here and manage his brother's investments. Over the course of time, Charles convinced Frank that operating the Braden mine with a steam-driven power system was not as efficient as doing so with electricity. And so Frank Ray, at Charles Ray's insistence, started buying up property on both sides of the Rogue River, looking for a place to build a hydroelectric facility. They decided that a site near Tola was the most appropriate site because of the bedrock there, and they began building a power facility with the intent of powering their mine. After they got it going, they realized that they could make more money selling electricity to the local communities than they could mining. So they sold the mine and kept the electric station. This is a photo from 1929. The center of everything out there was the powerhouse, and that was where all of the activity and most of the investment was focused. The project manager probably had his own home, may have lived there with his family, and this could well be his house. The other workers lived in what started out as a clubhouse, probably became a bunkhouse. There's talk in some early newspaper accounts about workers being housed at the site. There were, you know, many, many workers working on this project for over a year. And then after it was completed, the Rays envisioned it as something like a clubhouse where people would come out and spend the day playing cards, smoking cigars, whatever guys did then. Up at the top of the hill is this elaborate structure that's the water tower. And all it was was a tank. They pumped water up to it, held the tank, and then used water pressure to come down and serve the facility. Put a little Greek colonnade on it. It was a pretty elaborate little building for what it was. This is Dr. Charles Ray, proud of his new purchase. This is a 1904 original vertical turbine at Gold Ray in the original part of the powerhouse that was built to supply power to Medford for the first time. You can compare the vertical turbine with the horizontal turbines that actually powered Gold Ray after 1905. This is the plan drawing of the original Gold Ray powerhouse, probably drawn in 1904. It's narrow, it's got a very small cupola on it, and this is the design of the power system when there were two vertical turbines rather than the horizontal turbines that were installed later. We don't know exactly what the capacity of this project was. It was probably about 425 kilowatts about half, a third of what Gold Ray would become. And they used this in the late 1904 when they started generating power and sending it to Medford for the first time. And the demand was such that they immediately realized it was too small. So they began making plans to build a larger plant. In early 1905, they ordered two giant generators from the General Electric Corporation, 750 kilowatts each. They couldn't shut off the initial turbines because they still had to provide power to the city. So what they did was redesign the forebay and take what had previously been a straight shot from the head gates and expanded it into the river channel, widening it so that they could continue to send water to the original turbines while they excavated a pit for larger turbines and built an extension to the powerhouse. This is a very, very unusual design. They put in horizontal turbines, not vertical turbines like we think of usually. 
These turbines didn't spin like a top, they spun like a squirrel cage. And the water would come through and spin the turbines, which would spin a drive shaft. And where it gets very unusual, instead of the drive shaft being connected directly to the generator, which is what happens in most powerhouses, it was collected first to a lower pulley. And then that lower pulley, which was buried in the bowels of the powerhouse, was connected to an upper pulley by 1,600 feet of inch and a half manila rope. That upper pulley, which was up at the power floor level, would then spin another drive shaft, and that drive shaft would drive the 750 kilowatt generators. This drawing, updated to 1910, shows sort of how the powerhouse evolved. The two 750 kilowatt generators are in place. You can see the rope drive pulleys and how they're offset, and you can see the four turbine wheels that spun the whole thing. You can also see over here where the old wheel pits from the original 1904 turbines had been removed. And what I like about this one is that you can also see that the Ray brothers were thinking ahead and that they put into their new extended forebay space for future draft tube openings for units three and four. Those units never got built, but they were planning ahead when they made the forebay so wide. Even with the expanded capacity after 1905, 1.5 megawatts, there was still a need for more power. And so they brought back one of the original 1904 generators and reinstalled it into the powerhouse. Probably generated about 400, 425 kilowatts, which would have given a total capacity to Gold Ray of just over 2 megawatts. In the second turbine bay, in the original powerhouse, they put in a centrifugal pump that was capable of pumping 2,000 gallons per minute. This was part of an irrigation scheme for irrigation in orchards. That didn't work out so well, and they eventually took it out. One of the really interesting things about this drawing, which is dated 1908, right after this generator had been put in, is that it too obviously was a rope drive system. The 1904 generator that was reinstalled in the powerhouse in 1908 stays in use at Gold Ray until 1921, and then Copco, who had by that time purchased this facility, moved it down to a power plant in Keno on the Klamath River. This drawing was done in 1906, and it shows you the newly expanded powerhouse with the two larger generation units in place, the two rope drive systems are visible, the twin 42-inch turbines are in place, and the discharge arches and everything from the original 1904 powerhouse have essentially been closed off and are abandoned. When the Gold Ray project was first developed in 1904, it was an industrial facility, but it was also sort of a tourist destination, and it was envisioned as the showplace of industry and of the future. They actually had tours out there. There was a train line that ran on the other side of the river channel, and it would stop, and people would get off. They would go and fish at Gold Ray. They would come and see the timber mill and visit the dam site and the powerhouse. There was this elaborate bridge across the channel so that you didn't have to walk. The Rays built a clubhouse, this very large two-story building that was built up the slope from the powerhouse and envisioned it as sort of being a man's place, I think, where people could come and have drinks and play cards and that sort of thing. They built a whole series of structures to support all of these industrial and sort of almost social uses on the site. And probably the best testament to that, in addition to the clubhouse, was the little water tank, which they took the trouble of putting a colonnade in front of and turning it into a little Grecian temple. By 1941, the rays were long gone, and a large building, which had been built as a clubhouse, had outlived its usefulness. There just weren't that many people at Gold Ray anymore, and there certainly wasn't much of a social scene. The California Oregon Power Company, being more businesslike, tore down that large building and built these two little bungalows on the same site. Still using the fine stone wall and retaining all of those site improvements, but building buildings for probably the one or two workers that now operated the facility for them. And that rock wall still survives along with all of the wonderful stonework and the, what must have been a fountain. They got tired of the fussiness of the water tower by 1941 and they took that colonnade off and just exposed the water tower, which looks like we would expect a water tower at an industrial facility to look. By the early 1940s, the old log crib dam was failing. They would have to sandbag it, it was leaking. 
John Boyle, the chief hydro engineer for COPCO, designed a new concrete dam, uh, significantly larger, that would be built immediately in front of the old log crib dam. They also built a new fish ladder and generally upgraded the facility considerably. This was taken in November 1941 as the current Gold Ray Dam is just about completed and they are trying to figure out what to do with the 1904 log crib dam behind it. They had hoped to simply burn it. They tried to douse it with kerosene or crankcase oil to make it more flammable. It essentially smoked a whole bunch and like anything that had been underwater for half a century didn't burn so well. Electricity was really sort of a gee whiz kind of a thing in its earliest years and people were not only excited to get it but they believed that it was going to bring them a better more modern life. This is an ad from about 1915 published in the Medford Mail Tribune. Prosperity follows the wire, the California Oregon Power Company. The way you can tell this is early is the use of the swastika, which was a traditional good luck symbol, but fell on harder times after World War II. This is a small collection of postcards of Gold Ray Dam and Powerhouse. Most of them were published before World War I, but there are some that go up into the 1960s. I think it's fascinating that so many postcards were made of what is essentially an industrial facility. It talks to the pride that the Southern Oregon area had in having built the Gold Ray Powerhouse and really the hope of what it was going to mean for the future of Southern Oregon. They would send these cards out to people encouraging them to visit and hopefully move their businesses here in sort of a booster or promotional way that, that we don't really think of today. This was postmarked in 1909 and it reads, The Gold Ray Dam on the Rogue River furnishing light and power for Southern Oregon. I can't imagine that we would make a postcard of a power dam today or that we would send it across the country boasting of the fact that we had electricity and how it was produced. They had a whole series of bridges. There was a wooden bridge, there was a wooden bridge that was repaired with concrete piers, and then finally a steel bridge that was built across the river. All of that lasted until 1964 in the Christmas Day flood, and there's a great piece of communication in the Pacific Corp archive where the area manager is writing to the Gold Ray manager and says, what about the bridge? And the Gold Ray manager writes back very succinctly, all gone. The superstructure washed down the river and was presumably scrapped. The two concrete piers, however, survive, and one of them is a great place to go fishing. Not only did the Rays have to build Gold Ray to generate the power, they had to build the distribution and transmission lines to send that power to Medford and Ashland and Jacksonville and Talent and Grants Pass. And in most of those communities, they had to build a substation where the direct line from Gold Ray Dam could be stepped down so it could go out to people's houses and light their electric appliances. The substation in Jacksonville still survives, which is right at the end of California Street, is now a Christian discount bookstore. 